Good day, both Al and Paul. Uh, I'm so happy that you're, uh, you've are you agreed to do this video interview with me today about your new book. It just came out April 4th, according to Amazon, yes. uh, Exemplary Performance. For our audience, could you please each take a turn and introduce yourselves and give us a little bit about your professional background, uh, just so the audience uh, has a better understanding of where you're coming from? Paul, could you start for us? Be happy to do that. So as a young graduate student, uh, many, many moons ago, I became really fascinated. My undergraduate was psych. I became fascinated with human learning and particularly in adults. I tell people I never did the couch thing. I never got into the clinical psych. And, but I uh, decided to pursue graduate work in human learning, uh, ended up uh, finishing at University of Illinois where I got my PhD. And uh, the idea I thought was to work with adults started off in technical environments and that if people knew more, their workplace performance would be elevated. So the first real job I took in a setting like that was at a nuclear power plant. Uh, a small incident had occurred called Three Mile Island. It was really a, a small technical problem multiplied many times over by human error. And so suddenly regulations were coming out. The entire workforce in the nuclear industry needed to be retrained. So I stepped into that and ran that redesign for an entire plant. Uh, really enjoyed it and have a uh, a biased view that nuclear power got a bad name. But anyway, uh, in the process of that, uh, there was another small company called General Motors uh, that was going to inf infuse billions and billions of dollars in new manufacturing technology. And they decided they wanted to find somebody with a deep technical training background. Uh, to consult with them uh, during this process. Uh, and so uh, I uh, was approached by them through a, through a consulting company, but GM did the interviews and selection. And I uh, became part of a small team that started off benchmarking best practices. It, uh, one of the people was a lead engineer, another was from the uh, training organization, and the three of us traveled around the country, Johnson Space Flight Center, uh, Boeing, American Airlines. Uh, obviously, I brought a nuclear experience to it. And one of the people they wanted to benchmark was a gentleman by the name of Joe Harless and his job aids workshop. So we went down to Atlanta, went to the workshop, and I spent two days with a two by four being slapped against the side of my head saying I had no comprehension how to impact people's performance. First of all, I was defaulting to human learning. Secondly, I assumed all information should reside in the heads of the performers. And third, I thought equipped people would perform better just because they were equipped. Uh, all that was diffused at the end of the two days. And uh, I spent the next couple years working with GM uh, after the benchmarking practice, coming up with models to improve performance and started to use Joe Harless's accomplishment-based curriculum development model and later what he called PQI, the perform, uh, PIQ, performance, no, PQI, performance quality improvement tool set. Uh, so this totally changed my practice. Uh, I started, A, to focus on elevating performance, not increasing skills alone. Certainly people need to know in order to do the right things, to produce the right accomplishments. But I certainly met a lot of people who knew a lot who were not high performers. It changed the source of the data we all talk about SMEs, subject matter experts. Uh, Joe's source, primary source of data, you might use SMEs, you might use all kinds of different people, process engineers, 
but the primary source of data were accomplished performers, current people in role. And uh, it changed the solution set from training to an integrated performance system that was focused on producing greater outcomes. Uh, so that was quickly kind of my background. Uh, when Joe retired in 1998, I acquired uh, the Harless Performance Guild. In 2001, I had the opportunity to sell the IP and go to work for a software company that was doing an LMS. And in 2004, I uh, had met my three-year commitment and started a company called Exemplary Performance, which has recently been sold to Jamie Torsiana. But anyway, that's a snapshot uh, and um, really have worked primarily with business leaders, uh, business executives, very little with HR or L&D over the past 30 years, bringing these tools uh, into a commercial environment. I will mention that in 1995, I was approached by an organization and the individual in that organization, uh, Al Folsom, later to be Captain Al Folsom, about infusing that into the United States Coast Guard. And uh, that's been the one federal agency I've worked with off and on uh, over the years. And hence, uh, co-authored this with Al. Well, Al, let's turn to you then. Uh, can you give us a little bit about your background in the L&D world and, and how that relates to this book? Sure, sure. So as Paul just mentioned, uh, I was in the Coast Guard, uh, spent 28 years there. Um, early on in my career, I was... Uh, I was an instructor at uh, Officer Candidate School. Um, as part of that, Coast Guard had some great training for, <clears throat> you know, podium skills, how to be a, a good instructor in a classroom. Um, they sent me off to, after a little while, into a course developers course, which was training for ISD. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I went to a workshop called JAWS, Job Aids Workshop. <clears throat> Uh, the Joe Harless workshop for job aids and also had, you know, kind of uh, changed my outlook ever since. Right. So that changed uh, professionally, personally, my thinking um, after that tour as an instructor went back afloat on a ship. And as, as part of helping our ship do better work in enforcement in uh, navigation, uh, even in personal development, ended up developing many job aids that people could use without having to spend a lot of time in training and were able to produce results to standard. Um, and wanted to follow that up. The Coast Guard had a program for instructional technology, a graduate school program, went off to Penn State, uh, got a PhD there, spent a semester um, with an analysis performance analysis course there where the textbook was something called human competence. Um, so again, it impacted me greatly after I returned back to the Coast Guard, uh, was in Yorktown, Virginia, and the Coast Guard had this idea that they were going to create a performance technology and training center. And so when I arrived, the new PhD from Penn State, they invited me to the table said, what do you think? And I saw lots of articles, printouts from, authored by Joe Harless and others, but that seemed to be a dominant thought. And I said, well, my first thinking is, why don't we ask this guy, Joe Harless, to come up here and help us? And they said, sure, uh, you call him. All right. So I cold called Joe Harless, who said, hey, I, uh, I just retired. I'll, I'll exchange some faxes with you. Um, collegially. Um, and I want to introduce you to this guy named Paul Elliott. Uh, he's a pretty good fella. And uh, that's who you should go with. So first thing, I'll just comment. Joe said, what are you going to call this place? Well, the Performance Technology and Training Center. He said, well, that seems rather redundant. Just call it the Performance Technology Center. And it was. 
and it is to this very day. Uh, that's the name. Um, and one of the first things we did was we trained up about 20 people in the front end analysis workshop uh, to give a, a performance technology mindset to, to everybody kind of level set. Um, after that, I, I did a, a workforce restructuring project for the Coast Guard um, that looked at half of the enlisted workforce, um, restructured that, those uh, ratings, uh, biggest re reorganization in, since World War II. Um, and again, during that, uh, I reached out to Paul Elliott, who helped with that uh, greatly. Um, and then subsequently was training officer in Petaluma, California, and finally the chief learning officer of the Coast Guard in Washington, D.C. Uh, retired out of that job and, um, you know, unemployed, uh, looked over to uh, exemplary performance and uh, spent years with, uh, with Paul working in the commercial sector primarily, uh, again, with some uh, analysis projects uh, supporting the Coast Guard and others. And so that, that kind of uh, subsequent to that, um, I joined a company called SNAP and uh, I lead the DOD and Coast Guard programs for SNAP and uh, uh, nights and weekends uh, have collaborated with Paul on the update revised version of this book called Exemplary Performance. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that uh, in your story there, where, where Joe asked about the name, that just reminded me of when NSPI, ISPI was, was changing their names from uh, the National Society for Performance and Instruction. He, he would complain about that name saying, well, that's like the Department of Transportation and Bicycles. <laughs> so I think we, we, the three of us all come from that same world to having a performance yes. orientation. And that's why I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk with you today about this book that you've uh, just come out with the second edition of. And uh, but so let's shift our attention now to your book, Exemplary Performance. I have a three part uh, opening question here for you. And uh, it is, so who did you write this book for? Why did you write it? And what do you hope the takeaways are for the readers? Who's up for answering that? I'll take that one. And uh, the title is Exemplary Performance. The subtitle is Driving Business Results by Benchmarking Your Star Performers. Right. So the subtitle goes back to the point I made, what's the source of data? Uh, accomplished performers or exemplary performers are those people who consistently produce exceptional results within the organization of which they're a part. It could be the US Coast Guard. It could be Microsoft where I've consulted for decades. It could be uh, HSBC, GM, Ford, Chrysler, BP, ExxonMobil. Uh, and I name those names because at one level, uh, the book is written for people leading companies like that, right? Um, in fact, uh, the cover I'm going to put up, not just because, I guess you can kind of see it there, uh, not just because of the subtitle, but the graphic. So there's a, there's a curve, and then there's a shaded curve. Uh, the idea is every organization has a curve, a distribution of levels of performance. Some people are exceptional. The great bulk are doing an adequate job. And uh, the fallacy we try to address in the book and why it's written for business leaders is that that distribution is a given. We hire people, they walk in the room with a set of talents, experiences, education, training, and some are going to be good, some are going to be great, and some aren't going to work out. And the role of the organization and management is to make the distinguish, to distinguish between, to make the distinction between uh, the good and the great and to sort out 
the low performers. Uh, perhaps to invest an inordinate amount of time in the low performers, hoping to address their performance. And uh, so that's the audience for which it was originally written, along with people like Al and I, who are practitioners and you, Guy, uh, and our colleagues at ISPI and uh, ATD and others, because it outlines the entire process of how to do this kind of work. In a very real sense, uh, Joe produced world-class job aids. If I turn my computer, you'd see them on my shelf, uh, showing how to do this kind of work in great detail. But he didn't write a lot of treaties about the why and the overarching process. Al and I believe we've done that on his behalf and we certainly in the attribution in the a section on appreciation mentioned his influence that for 25 years, uh, the two of us have been A, impacted by, B, mentored by, and forever changed by his influence. So in a sense, uh, it's not an, a biography of Joe Harless, uh, but it is an encapsulation of his thinking. Uh, so practitioners are the second audience. Uh, they can understand the rationale, they can read case studies, they can see a process description, not to the level of detail that Joe provided in, 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 the, in his job aids and his tools, but unfortunately they're no longer available. So it's a close, it's an approximation. Uh, so they're the audiences. Now, the second part of the question was, I'll let you state it again for the audience and for me, because I put that piece of paper out of my sight. <laughs> well, so, so, so the first question was, who did you write it for? But why did you write it? I think you've kind of answered that as well. But, but then what do you hope the takeaways are for the audience? Well, uh, yes, and I have a little bit more about the why. Uh, in, in 2020, the estimates are that the gross profitability of U.S. corporations was about $20 trillion. I believe organizations leave about 10% more on the table because they make a false assumption that the variance between good and great is predetermined before the folks walk through the door. We may educate them, we may train them, but they come in with a given profile, be that a disc kind of inventory, give it their past experience, given their IQ, given their talent that um, is gonna really sort them out into which of the categories, A, Bs or Cs, they fall into. Al and I and Joe and you and others believe that's a totally false assumption. We don't mean that people can become totally exceptional with zero talent, but in a great book that a, the a lead editor at Fortune wrote called Talent is Overrated, talent is not the do dominant determinant of your level of performance. It's a performance system where the talent you bring to the table is necessary, but never sufficient to be a good performer, a high performer. So the purpose of writing it is to challenge a false assumption. I mean, the data is overwhelming. It's the wrong assumption uh, and say, by taking a systemic integrated approach, we can elevate the performance of people, increasing their accomplishments, their outcomes, their results, uh, without elevating the cost structure. We can get more from the existing 
resource, the human capital. Uh, and so that's basically the premise of the book. And when Al talks about the flow of the book, we kind of lay that out. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so, Al, let's shift into now the, the book itself and the structure and flow, however you want to go through this. But uh, what might the readers, uh, you know, what will they uh, be con uh, confronted with or uh, see in the book itself? So why don't you walk us through the book for us? Sure. Thank, thanks, Guy. So <clears throat> the book is, um, first off, two sections, part one, part two. Part one is about defining the opportunity. So as, as Paul just described, business leaders who are responsible for results, um, you know, what can they do to make their company, their organization, their, their uh, area of responsibility more successful, uh, more profitable, uh, better results? there's a number of different things they could do. They could reorganize. They could send people off to training. They could say, well, let's do a better job of hiring. Um, our, our proposition is that they should consider, look at their star performers and do internal benchmarking and, and figure out how to get better results by having people perform more like their star. So Chapter one is about the value of leveraging your star performers. The second one is prioritizing. So in a company, you know, we have a lot of different roles. We have a lot of different departments. Well, where do you place the, the limited resources you have? Where are you going to get the best return on investment? And so we walk through that in, in chapter two. The, the third chapter is about how do you select and identify the star performers? As, as Paul said, there's people might think, well, we've, we've got ways of identifying the A players or we, we you know, give the IQ test or we say, well, who's, who's been here the longest? Um, so we go through how to identify except, exceptional performers. And sometimes uh, it may be that it's an exceptional team who's, the highest performing team? And what are the metrics that matter the most? <clears throat> How do we really triangulate to get to who are truly the, the star performers? Um, now that we've identified who the stars are, well then, how do we capture their expertise, their insights? And, and part of that is um, really honing in on what are the major accomplishments that those stars produce? How do they, what's their mental model for how do they see success? I, I guess in a simple way, um, if you think about the FedEx delivery person, there, there's probably an ISD somewhere who's done a task analysis and listed out what are the tasks and steps that they need to do to train the new people. But what are the accomplishments that they produce? Is it package at destination on time. Well, uh, or customer with package at destination on time. And so if that's the mental model that they're able to derive from their stars, and then that becomes the expectation that goes into future delivery people, look, this is what you need to think of. Uh, I did a project at a, at a car dealership. They had a, they had a slogan, um, DISC. So, and they would tell every new person, whether they were in sales or, or any other part of that car company, every point of your day, you need to ask the question, does it sell cars? Does it satisfy customers? Well, that, that was kind of elegant, right? Because it, it kind of removes the chatter. If you're not contributing to one of those two accomplishments, you're doing the wrong thing. And so taking that concept out into businesses and organizations to say, in a given role, what are the major accomplishments that need to be focused on? Now, beyond that, in capturing the data, we do then go into, all right, not just the major accomplishments, but what are the tasks that contribute to producing each of those accomplishments? And what are the factors and influences? And so all that data becomes part of what goes into chapter two, or into part two of the, of the book. 
Now, there is a fifth chapter in part one called What Makes Them Tick? And I think it's because there's a fascination among people as to well, how did Tiger Woods get to be so fabulous? What goes into that? And there's, there's, a, there's a number of myths that we dispel as to what makes the superstar super. And then we go into what are the common, the, the common traits that really do contribute to star performers. In fact, this past weekend, um, I, I saw Tiger Woods in an interview say, you know, with the leg, with the age, I'm no, I'm no longer able, he said, to hit a thousand golf balls a day at the driving range. Now you just think about that. There, there is some intentional practice that goes on in, in the ability of stars to become the superstars that they are. Um, so for part two of the book, it's about, all right, now that we have the data, we need to shift the performance curve. How do we take the average performers, the typical performers, and help get their performance more like that of the stars? And so we, in the in kind of the logo star of the six factors here, in the center, it says exemplary performance. But what, what that really is, the performance in the middle, are the accomplishments, the accomplishments for each role. And those accomplishments are affected by six different categories or factors that we have. The first one is expectations and feedback. And so the research is that for people who are already in role, the number one factor for influencing their performance positively or negatively is expectations and feedback. And so we, we go into a, a, a good deal of how to convey expectations, the power of it, feedback, feedback systems, the timing of the feedback, the precision of the feedback, the coaching that goes along with the feedback to coach people to produce those accomplishments that have value to the organization. And then uh, next is about rewards, recognition, and consequences. And of course, all these are um, non-discrete factors because they all play into one another. And so if your rewards and recognition are not aligned with the expectations and feedback that you give, then things aren't gonna work optimally. Um, the, the next one is about motivation, uh, intentionality and deliberate practice. So I, I mentioned Tiger Woods. Um, again, it's, I think some, pardon for the golf analogy, but there are some of the greatest golfers. I, I, I'm thinking Jack Nicklaus, Tiger Woods, the, the idea of saying, not only am I hitting a thousand golf balls, but I'm hitting them as if I'm in the middle of a tournament and that swing counts whether I'm going to win the tournament or not. It's not just going through the motion of hitting a thousand golf balls. It's the intentional practice evaluating, did that do what I wanted it to do? And so, again, by, by tapping into the motivation of people, again, the non-discrete factors, people generally show up to the job motivated on day one. And so to be able to tap into what's motivating about this job and, and make those things clear to performers uh, continues to, to support that motivation. Um, the next chapter is about training and performance support. There are times when we need to train things to memory. And there are other times when that's not necessary, nor as efficient, nor as reliable. And a performance support like a job aid or an electronic performance support tool is the right, um, the right tool, the right solution to be factored into it. Um, and then the next is, is about um, selecting people for the job. And so... Uh, again, what's the best person for this job? Someone who has previously performed the, the, the required accomplishments to standard. Um, again, tying into expectations. If we are advertising for a position, here's the job description, but the real job is nothing like that. W what happens? Well, we've got a bad hire, a bad fit, and motivation has just gone downhill. And so organizations may say, well, we, let's train better. 
Well, it, at this point, we're kind of on a on a losing proposition if we haven't selected up front uh, people who are going to be a good match to what the real job requirements are. We also call it truth in advertising. So does the job description reflect the accomplishments that are expected on the job, or is it something generic out of an HR department that really doesn't really match up with the true priorities? And then um, lastly, we have a chapter on creating barrier-free work systems. And so here, we're not just talking about uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. We're, we're talking about things that get in the way, processes and systems and tools that uh, have, we, have we created the job, have we created the process so that people can create the accomplishments without the barriers. Lastly, and I'm going to kind of dovetail this, we have three case studies at the end. One of them, one of them is uh, about a flooring sales specialist, another is about pharmaceuticals, and another one is from banking. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the flooring sales specialist, where the systems and tools did not align with what the accomplishment was. And so all the star performers that we interviewed, and in this case, we were able to spend time with just the top 1% um, to a person, they had all found and identified and were using workarounds to the system. And so what's the takeaway? You know, when people say, well, how do you redesign the system? Well, your own people have figured out better ways to make this thing happen. And so that kind of summarizes, and, and then there's an index at the end. <laughs> well, Al, thank you for that overview of the book. Um, and my next question then to the two of you is, so where can people find your book and in what formats is it available? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, the first edition was published by Josie Bass Wiley. Uh, this second edition we have self-published. And we took the easy path of working with Amazon slash Kindle Direct Press. Uh, so it's available both as a paperback and as an ebook. Uh, paperback has been there for about a week and the ebook for 24 hours. So, uh, but they're both available via Amazon. Uh, if anybody wanted large quantities, they could uh, reach out to our myself, like someone's doing a workshop or a class, we'd be happy to talk to them about that. Uh, but they are available, uh, let's say retail via Amazon. Well, thank you. I, uh, I did check out Amazon this morning and I did see that the Kindle version was available. I will put in the YouTube show notes uh, contact information for the two of you and as well as a link to Amazon so that people can explore this further and hopefully purchase the book. I would, I would highly recommend it. Um, uh, thank you so much, the two of you, for agreeing to do this interview and walking us through your new book the updated version of the book. And uh, I I'm looking forward to uh, seeing it myself. Um, Paul, Al, thanks again so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Guy. Appreciate it.